So I'm going to talk about reclamation criteria, in particular the peatland criteria, which we released recently, and a couple of slides on just some contaminated site guidance work that we're doing, and then the bulk of my talk will be on the Tier 1 updates that are in process. They're actually um, should be posted quite soon, so you'll see them shortly. For the peatland criteria, this was one that that got left aside back in 2010 when we updated the criteria. We did the other four, uh, other three land uses. But at the time, we felt like peatland reclamation was just not far enough along. It's a, it's a, you know, a, a, a particular topic area that needed more work. And there were some interesting research projects happening up in the boreal at the time, but they're in kind of early stages. So we put the peatland criteria on hold and a couple of years ago, I started to feel like some of those research projects were yielding enough information that we could make an initial uh, stab at, at putting peatland criteria together. So we, we've done that, we released them recently, and I just wanna, at a fairly high level, I, there, there is, there's a lot of detail in the criteria that uh, I won't have time to cover today, but give you a, a rough overview of what's, what's in the criteria and how they operate. I'm going to start with some concepts that you'll see in the criteria. One is obviously what, what is peat land, what do we apply these criteria to, and that's land that's covered by peat to a minimum depth of 40 centimeters. And like all specified land, peat land has to be returned to equivalent land capability. In peat land, that means bringing it back to a site that's got peat forming species. We want it on a trajectory to go back into a functioning peat land. That doesn't mean that every site on peatland will necessarily go to a peatland. There's, there's you know, times when you might end up doing something else with it. But if it's not going to a peatland, it needs a, a land use change approval from the land use officer. So that's part of the criteria. You're going to see two kinds of sites discussed in the criteria. One is an undisturbed site. The other is a, a disturbed site. Undisturbed means that, that ground layer is intact. So there may have been a bit of brushing or something on the site, but basically the ground layer has, has not been changed. And those would be you know, typically sites that are frozen in sites and uh, winter access, winter operations. Uh, under, uh, disturbed sites would be sites obviously that are disturbed where that ground layer has been disturbed or even removed. And they would be sites like uh, padded sites mulch sites or places where there's been coarse woody debris laid down, and obviously sites that were intended to be undisturbed, but where they got a little bit carried away and they've disturbed that ground layer cover too much. So that would become what we call a disturbed site. And sites like the other criteria within the, within the peatland criteria, there's the, opera, op, the, uh, the ability to stratify the site. So you might have a site that's partly disturbed, partly undisturbed, or it might be partly upland, partly peatland, uh, the criteria will work with that, similar to what uh, the other land uses do. When you look at the criteria, you're going to see uh, two steps to the assessment. Most criteria, all the other criteria have three steps. You have landscape, vegetation, and soil. Peatland criteria, you, you, we don't have a soil component. We just have landscape and vegetation. In the landscape, portion of the, the assessment, we're really focusing a lot on what's happening with the hydrology. A really key factor in getting peat species back on the site is to have the water table at the right place. You, wanna, you want the soil saturated, but you also want to be creating a bit of an aerobic zone too. So uh, getting the water table right is quite critical. So that's part of what the landscape assessment will look at. Um, we're going to be looking for open water, ponding, or upland ecosites, both of which are not conducive to peat formation. And then we're looking at off-site drainage, which is going to be also quite critically tied into to the water regime on the site itself. And then there's kind of the standard things that we look at in all the criteria for landscape around erosion and bare areas and other things. For the vegetation assessment, we're really focusing on do we have desirable species there, desirable meaning peat forming species, and do we have the wrong kind of species there, obviously, species that are not forming peat. So it's really, it's, it's that whole peat forming function that we're focusing on. We're also looking at species richness. 
Some peatlands are wooded, so if the surrounding area has woody species on it, we would expect those to come back on the site as well. So we'll be looking at woody species. Not every peatland is like that, so if it's not a wooded, uh, not in an area that would normally be wooded, we would not expect woody species. But on a wooded site, that'll be part of the vegetation assessment. So this is, the, this is how the criteria function at a high level. I'm not gonna get into the actual criteria and assessment values themselves, but when you're going to a site that's, you know, you've you reclaimed it to a peatland, the first thing you would do is assess the landscape. And if that fails, then obviously you're, you're back to the drawing board. But if that passes, you would move on to the vegetation assessment. And then it really depends what kind of a site you're dealing with. If you're dealing with an with a undisturbed site, you would go straight to that undisturbed assessment. And there's, there's this particular assessment process for, the, for undisturbed sites. And it's really assessing whether or not the, the on-site and off-site peatland are of a similar type. So there can be some, some impacts, but generally speaking, if you've got a, you know, a rich fan off-site, you wanna have a rich fan on-site and so on. And that vegetation criteria that you're gonna use will, it, will assess the intactness of the site. And if it passes that uh, assessment, then essentially your site passes and you're ready to apply for a certificate. If it fails that undisturbed assessment, your site doesn't necessarily fail, but it means the site has been disturbed and you're gonna to have to move into the disturbed criteria. And of course, if you've got a site that's obviously disturbed, you would, you would bypass the, the undisturbed assessment. You'd go straight to disturbed assessment. Disturbed assessments, uh, there are more work. There's more things to measure and look at. They're gonna take a little more time. So the advantage of having undisturbed sites, which we really wanna promote, is that you get a little easier, a quicker assessment out of that. But the disturbed assessment you know, certainly requires more work. And what you're doing then is you're assessing to see whether that site is forming peat. You're looking for those peat forming species. And the species may be different than what's in the surrounding area. And in a lot of cases, that's almost certainly gonna be the case, especially if you're dealing with a padded site or something like that. Uh, it may well be coming back to a different type of peatland, but really what we want to see is peat forming. So whether it's exactly the same uh, trajectory as the offsite, we're not so worried about that as we are about getting a peatland forming back on that site. So that's what the assessment will focus on, is whether you've got the right peat forming species on the site. Some of these sites you're going to want to do some planting on to help that process along, and in the criteria there are species lists so that you would go to your site and you'd say, my site looks like it's coming back to a rich fen, let's say, but I need to do some planting. You can look in those species lists for that type of fen and see what's the most likely uh, species that are gonna do well there and you can pick your, your, uh, your plantation, your planting species from, from those species lists. So the lists are really just intended as an aid to, to reclamation. So we released this, the, the criteria in October and they've got an April 15th implementation date. So any uh, peatland sites that are being assessed after April 15th have to be assessed against the peatland criteria. We also did some revisions to the coal and oil sands exploration reclamation requirements and part of that uh, revision was to incorporate and, and reference the peatland criteria. A lot of those, especially OSE sites, are, are happening on peatland, so we wanted to make sure we made the linkage to the peat criteria. There's a, a, a lot of detail around how to do the assessment. It's a little bit different concept than some of the other criteria, so uh, I would really encourage anybody who's working in peatland to try and get some training on it. CLRA, Fanny Mansion, uh, uh, they're working with Susan McGilvery who led the development of the criteria to put some lunch and learns together. Uh, so that'll be helpful. You'll have an hour or so to really focus on the criteria. And I think if there's enough demand, there, there may, we, well, not us, but uh, with some groups that are interested in putting uh, maybe a more field-based peak course together. So. Uh, just kind of stay tuned for that, and if that's of interest, it, you know, it doesn't hurt to let us know that uh, uh, you're feeling like a, a more focused peat criteria, you know, a couple of days would be useful, and, and that would help move that along, I'm sure. So we'll move on to contaminated site guidance. 
And one of the things we've been working on over the last year is better coordination with some of the other agencies that get involved in contaminated sites, but maybe have less frequent involvement than either ourselves at Alberta Environment and Parks or the Alberta Energy Regulator, kind of the, the two main players, I suppose. But sites sometimes attract the attention of Alberta Health and Alberta Health Services, and that specifically happens if, if there's a contamination situation that's directly impacting human health. So it might be contamination into a drinking water supply, uh, it might be a dry cleaner that's getting vapors into the, uh, the building, that sort of scenario where there, where there is an actual uh, exposure happening. Alberta Health steps in on those. The, their legislation empowers them to get involved. And up until recently, they, they have not really been in sync and we haven't been in sync with them in terms of the, the toxicity benchmarks that we're using. And some of you might be familiar with the the sulfalane issue, the gas plant that's had a sulfalane leak and it's made it into somebody's water well and Alberta Health Services have been involved and there's just been some confusion around what's the right guidelines in drinking water for, for uh, sulfalane. This committee is sort of intended to, to you know, head those kind of issues off at the pass. So we're sitting down with uh, Alberta Health Services and the energy regulator, Alberta Health, and uh, agreeing on how we're going to pick specifically toxicity benchmarks that then feed into the, the development of guidelines. And uh, they're making really good progress. Some of the tier one guidelines that I'm gonna talk about have come through that vetting process. So going forward, you know, when, when there are some, some impacts that are bringing Alberta Health into the picture, then we're, we're, we're basically working off the same toxicity data and, and approaching sites in the same way. So. I think uh, it's kind of a, something that we've probably been needing to do for a while and, and uh, finally getting at it and I think uh, it'll, it'll be quite beneficial for everybody. We've also got some new guidelines either out or in the works. Uh, the environmental site assessment standard uh, was posted. It's already up on the website. I just sent out a, an email notice yesterday on that. It's got a March 1st deadline, so for once we actually got it on the web before it was, before the date went up instead of afterwards, which is what usually happens, which is what's going to happen with Tier 1, almost certainly. But that's up, uh, so you want to have a look at that. Some of you might have reviewed it way back when we had our first draft out for public review, and it's going to look quite a bit different than that first draft. So. I would really encourage people to download that and go through it because it's going to set the expectations for what environmental site assessments should look like if they're being submitted to either Alberta Environment and Parks or their energy regulator uh, for some form of regulatory closure. We're also putting the finishing touches on the exposure control guide. That should be up uh, fairly soon. And the risk management plan guide is another one. If you're working on risk managed sites, you'll be interested in that. That's a new one. So we're, we're trying to get a draft together and then that'll be posted for public review probably in the next month or so. And it'll go through the review process and the revision process and before, before being finalized. And uh, tier one updates. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on that. And we're gonna start with boron, probably spend the most time on boron because that's been a long standing project for us. Um, and one that we've finally completed and it's feeding into the tier one revisions. And boron's an issue in the province because we do run into it from time to time. It's a, it gets used as a cleaning agent. Boric acid was used at well sites sometimes to clean things, other places. It's a pesticide. It appears in certain treated wood products. And uh, ant killer, if you've ever bought ant killer, chances are it had boron in it. Fiberglass plants often have issues with boron. It's also in produced water, it's in, in ash, coal ash, wood ash. So it, it appears as a contaminant sometimes, but it also appears uh, as a background uh, because it is a natural constituent of soil. And one of the challenges with developing these guidelines is that plants need a certain amount of boron in soil but like anything, if there's too much, it becomes toxic. And plants vary widely in their ability to tolerate boron. Some plants can handle a lot. Some plants can handle hardly any. And especially for those sensitive species, that window between not enough and too much is really narrow. And that's one of the challenges in, in developing these guidelines. 
One of the big drivers has been this whole background boron issue that in our clay tails, we often encounter naturally occurring boron levels that exceed tier one guidelines. And so it makes for more work in, in terms of sampling to prove you've got background. And, and some of our urban areas, Edmonton in particular, runs into that problem a lot. And it's often very hard to find background samples in, a, in an urban area. So it's developed a lot of challenges related to applying tier one on, tier one boron on uh, contaminated site uh, projects. So we thought we would take a look at some of the issues around that, see whether that boron guideline that's currently in tier one was, you know, whether we could do something with that. And it's really, it's a very old guideline. It's based on old research. It's not risk-based. And uh, it also doesn't really address any toxicity to other organisms other than plants. So uh, from that perspective, it seemed like a good candidate to do some work on. We also knew that the the extraction method, the hot water extraction method, causes some problems, especially in organic soils, because it brings a lot of organic material into solution. And that organic material, because it came from plants that often had high boron just naturally, brings a lot of boron into solution, and then that shows up in the test, even though it may not be that available. So, so the methodology also was a bit of an issue for us. So we got to work uh, with uh, some money from, largely from uh, CAPS OPER fund. We worked through PTAC and uh, been working on the tox testing and revising the guidelines. And so we've used Alberta tier one protocol. So the new boron guidelines are fully risk-based. They address both humans and ecological receptors. We're changing methods. So to get away from that problem with the hot water method, we're moving to a saturated paste extract method. And we've also adjusted the irrigation guideline because that pathway is actually fairly sensitive. And uh, if you look at the surface water guidelines for irrigation, you'll actually, you'll see a range there. It goes from 0.5 milligrams per liter, I forget what the upper end is, but the advice is to choose a number based on the crops that you're irrigating because they vary so widely in their sensitivity. And if you look at the species at that very sensitive 0.5 milligram per liter, and it's species that we would not commonly see as crops in Alberta. So the one milligram per liter seems quite protective for Alberta species. That's what we've adopted for doing those pathways in tier one. So I mentioned we're moving to saturated paste extract. That means different units than we're used to. In the tier one guidelines for soil, we're used to dealing with milligrams per kilogram. When we see milligrams per liter, we're always thinking groundwater guidelines. But because we're moving to saturated paste extract, the, the soil guidelines are also going to be in milligrams per liter for boron. So just to be aware of that, uh, that's what you're, the results you're going to be getting from the lab will be in milligrams per liter. But the advantages of going to saturated paste is that it provides a better estimate of boron toxicity. It gets around some of these problems with organic soils. It lets us do one number for both coarse and fine textured soils for most of the pathway, so it simplifies the application of the guidelines. And it allows for us to calculate the groundwater protection pathways for drinking water, aquatic life, and so on which we typically don't do for metals because that sorption, desorption from soil piece is really difficult to do. But boron is quite soluble, not quite as soluble as chloride, but close. So by using a method that already starts with an equivalent to pour water boron, it makes it a lot easier to calculate those pathways. So we've got a full suite of pathways, uh, or almost a full suite uh, in the tier one guidelines. And the other advantage I think is that now you don't have to do a separate method for boron. You don't have to do a separate hot water extract. Most sites are getting salinity packages run. It's very common. And it's the same analytical method we use for salinity. So you, you just need to add, a, uh, add boron to the salinity package and, and you're good to go. So I think it'll simplify the analysis a bit too. So this is what the numbers look like. We'll start with human health. And you'll see the numbers are actually pretty generous. That's because boron is really not that toxic to humans. Uh, so if you work through the, the, the toxicity benchmarks, this is what you end up with. Uh, ecological guidelines, it's another story. And that's sort of 
backs up the, the fact that the earlier guidelines are based on plant toxicity, and plants turn out to be pretty much the most sensitive species. Some soil organisms are similar, but uh, that soil, soil dwelling organisms are really what, we're, what are turning out to be the, the most sensitive species. And the guidelines for the sensitive land uses are going to be 3.3 milligrams per liter. And for commercial and industrial, it's going to be 5 milligrams per liter, and that's based on an aquatic life protection pathway. So you can't really compare those numbers directly to the old tier one, because we have different extraction methods and we have different units. But in the scientific uh, support document that we put together, uh, our con the consultant that did the work was Equilibrium. They did a bunch of samples from across Alberta, different textures, different organic matter contents, using the old methodology and the new methodology to see how they compare. And, and this is what they get. And it's, it's, I, I'm showing them as nice, uh, nice lines, but it's actually there's a fair bit of scatter in the data. So at, at best, it gives you kind of a rough idea of how the new guideline compares to the old guideline. And for fine textured soil, or for coarse textured soil, 3.3 milligrams per liter turns out to be roughly around 3 milligrams per kilogram hot water soluble. So the current guidelines are two. So you get a little bit of headroom with the new guidelines. And most coarse textured soils are not that high in boron naturally. So I think we're probably will be OK there with respect to the background issue. Fine textured soils, there's a bigger difference. So 3.3 milligrams per liter would translate to about 7 milligrams per kilogram hot water soluble. So I think that's enough that it will take care of the, the boron background problems that were cropping up usually on, on clay tills and finer textured soils. Yet it's, I, I'm pretty confident they're still quite protective of plants growing there. Uh, organic soils, you can see the, that with that line, the effect that hot water soluble was having in pulling out so much boron. And 3.3 um, milligrams per liter is probably translates to being equivalent to around 40 milligrams per kilogram hot water soluble in, in say, a, a, um, you know, a peat material. So again, it really helps with that organic soil problem that we were running into quite high uh, background concentrations in, in organic soils. So that's it for boron. Those are the numbers that you'll see in the new Tier 1 guidelines. There's going to be some other revisions to Tier 1 as well, and these are driven by uh, changes to guidelines either from the CCME, because we adopt uh, a lot of their guidelines, or from Health Canada's Canadian Drinking Water Guidelines. And the Drinking Water Guidelines are used in the Tier 1 process to calculate uh, some of the groundwater protection numbers for drinking water. So when there's a change there, we have to revise Tier 1 to be consistent. So the two that are coming from CCME are nickel and methanol. And uh, nickel, we revised the toxicity, and Health Canada did some work on human health. And the upshot is the numbers aren't changing a whole lot. Uh, sensitive land uses are dropping a little bit. Commercial industrial is going up a bit. Uh, methanol, a quite a bit bigger change. And CCME, we actually contributed our methanol guidelines in Alberta to the CCME. And then in the process, they uh, updated the aquatic toxicity data and recalculated that guideline. And, and since we issued our guidelines, the US EPA has come up with a new human health benchmark. So that was done, used to revise the human health component. So the result is that uh, methanol is, is going up a fair bit. Uh, I've got the 2014, which is the current guidelines, and 2016 is what the new numbers will be up there. The other ones are driven by changes to the Canadian Drinking Water Guidelines. And they're, for some of them, are fairly significant. Chloroform, not so much. It's only coarse texture. It's actually going up a little bit. That's one we don't run into very often, but uh, in some of the urban areas that have a lot of leaking uh, water lines, that chloroform shows up because it's a, it's a product of chlorination in the water treatment process. So there's always a little background of chloride or chlor chloroform in drinking water, and sometimes that will build up if you've got a lot of leaking pipelines and really no place for it to go in an urban area. So. That's a, kind of a very specific contaminant we deal with. Uh, tetrachloroethylene, dry cleaners. Uh, so if you're dealing with dry cleaner sites, you're probably running into that. And it's going to go down. Uh, 
um, you know, roughly in half, I suppose. In terms of ethyl benzene and xylene, so for if you're working lots in the upstream world or gas station sites, you're running into that a lot. And again, they're dropping because the the uh, Canadian Drinking Water Guidelines have dropped. Ethyl benzene's gone down maybe 30% or so. But xylenes, that's quite a significant drop. It's, um, you know, we're talking order of magnitude kind of a drop. So you want to be careful to pay attention to that. I think a lot of upstream sites anyway, xylenes rarely drive cleanups under the current guidelines. But with this new revision, uh, I think we will see xylene becoming a driver on some of these sites. So you want to make sure that you're uh, checking the new guidelines when you're assessing sites. Groundwater, we're, we're seeing basically a similar uh, thing happening. Anything that changes in soil changes in groundwater. Um, so I'd mentioned the boron changes and the other, the, the other tier one revisions are for ethyl benzene, xylenes, uh, perc and methanol. And similar orders of magnitude change to what you would see uh, in the soil guidelines. There's gonna be other changes that will appear at a tier two level. I haven't brought those in. It gets a little too complicated to look at all the different tier two possibilities. But if you're doing tier twos, you wanna check those tables in appendix uh, A and B of the tier one guidelines to see uh, whether some of the changes that, that didn't drive a tier one, but they may have some influence at tier two. So you'll wanna check that. So we've got approval to release the tier one revisions. So that includes boron and the other tier one revisions. I've, I've sent the document to our web services for posting and they take however long they take to do their thing. So uh, it could come out at any time. I'm not, I'm, I, if I don't, if it's not up on Monday, I'll phone them up and see what's happening. I think they've had it for a couple of weeks now. So it should be up pretty quick. We'll be sending out a, a uh, email on our email notification list when that happens so that everybody's aware of it. If you're not on the list, you might want to go on the website and sign up. It's a good way to keep up to speed with uh, some of the regulatory changes. We're going to have a May 1st implementation date. So, you know, as soon as the guidelines are issued, they can be used. But uh, for especially for those compounds that are becoming more stringent, we want to give a chance for sites that are sort of almost finished or they're partway through the regulatory review process to just make their way through under the old guidelines and then sites that are uh, newer will, will have to meet the new guidelines. So like most of our revisions, we're, we're saying that uh, if a site is done before May 1st, and that means the the lab data sheets with the confirmatory samples, if those are dated prior to May 1st, you can use the 2014 guidelines. And if they're dated May 1st or later, then you have to use the new guidelines. So that'll be part of the announcement that, uh, that I send out, uh, hopefully in a few days here.